I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 25. We have been on a verse-by-verse journey through this wonderful gospel letter, and we've come to this 25th chapter. This is our second message in this chapter, and it is a a very important uh, section, as is all the Word of God. I said to my son uh, earlier this week, I, I feel like this particular section is very, very important for us to hear and learn from. And he said, well, Dad, you feel that way every week. (laughs) And so, again, we come to God's Word. Now, as I read the text, I want you to listen to it and welcome it for what it is. It is the Word of God. I want you to listen to it today as if your very life depended on it. And it does. Here is God's Holy Word. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each one according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. See, You have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has, more shall be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. 
in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of the living God. May we receive it to our hearts. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask in Jesus' name for the, the grace of illumination, for the capacity to understand your word. We ask for the, the heart to receive it and the will to obey what you have revealed to us. To the end that Jesus would be savingly known and faithfully followed. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. In my office, there's a sketch of one of my heroes of the Christian faith. His name is Charles Haddon Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers, without a doubt, the most quotable man on the planet or was on the planet. Charles Spurgeon said these words, the fact that Jesus Christ is to come again is not a reason for stargazing, but for working in the power of the Holy Spirit. In our text today, Jesus will set before us the spiritual and the eternal motivation for laboring faithfully for him until he comes. Would you give me your attention this morning as we seek to understand why faithfulness matters? Why faithfulness matters? Uh, this parable takes up the question left unanswered in the parable of the ten virgins, and that is, what constitutes readiness? As I said last week, in the first parable, we were taught to be ready, to be ready. In this parable, we are taught to be faithful, to be faithful. That is what readiness is. Would you write it down in capital letters? Readiness is being faithful to the master and his mission. And so we can easily say that if we're not being faithful, we're not ready. But if we are being faithful to the master and to his mission, then we are ready. Now, the parable of the talents is a masterful story. Jesus told this story about a wealthy man who was about to go away on a journey. He entrusted some of his riches to his three servants, recognizing the difference between their potential and giftedness. He gives to one five talents, to another two, and to another one. He charged them all, all to be faithful and wise in their stewardship until he returned. Upon his return, after a long journey, a day of reckoning took place. We see it in verse 19. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. You can circle verse 19. It is a, a key text, a key verse 
that tells us to pay attention because our master will come and settle accounts. Upon his arrival, to those who had been faithful, they were blessed to share in their master's joy. But to the one who was unfaithful, he is startled. He is surprised. He is actually shocked to find himself now cast into outer darkness where there is inconsolable grief and eternal regret. This is a sobering story. Now, how can we unpack this parable so that we clearly understand the lessons that Jesus would have us to gain this morning? Well, let me suggest to you, first of all, that there's a golden key that you must have. And that golden key helps us not to misinterpret the parable. The golden key is found in understanding that a talent is not an ability. It is not a coin. It is a measure of weight. It probably meant the weight of precious metal of, of some kind, so the, the heavier the precious metal you had, the more valuable it was. It is here that we must resist this contemporary thinking that says, that a talent is a natural ability. We must resist that kind of thinking. We think of talents today and we usually think of someone who is a, a very talented pianist or athlete or a musician. However, the talents spoken of in this parable has to do with something that has been entrusted by a master to be used for the master's benefit. Now let's write that down. It is something that was entrusted by a master to be used for the master's benefit. Now, if you receive that, then it is easy to see that Jesus is not speaking of the talents of individual persons, but rather he is speaking of the responsibility that we all have to be a faithful steward of what God has entrusted us with. Now, what has God entrusted us with? Bishop J.C. Ryle explains that a, a talent is anything we have whereby we may glorify God. Can I say that again? Anything we have whereby we may glorify God. That's a talent. In other words, it could be our gifts, our influence, our money, our knowledge, our health, our strength, our time, our senses, our reason, our intellect, our memory, our affections, our privileges, our advantages, all that we are, all that we have been given is a talent from God. Hmm. Now, if you can embrace that, if you can receive that, then you'll see that in this parable, the emphasis is not on the number of talents. But the issue here is about the diligence or the faithfulness by which the servants discharged their responsibility before their master. The language is the language of investment. The language is the language of stewardship. And as we shall see, what we do with what we've been entrusted with reveals 
if we love the master, if we belong to the master, and if we will have a share in his kingdom. What we do with what we have reveals those three things. Do we love him? Do we belong to him? And will we share in his kingdom? Let me try to frame this parable underneath these three headings. First, we will see the master's endowment. That's found for us clearly in verses 14 and 15. The master endowed his servants with goods, certain riches, to be used for his glory, for his the benefit, for his advance. Number two, the servant's employment. That's clearly seen for us in verses 16 through 18. And then we will come to the end of this parable and consider the master's evaluation. That's found in verses 19 through 30. The master's employ, uh, endowment, the servant's employment, and the master's evaluation. Let's zero in now on those things as we come to this text. Why should faithfulness matter to you and me? Why, why should it be important? It's important, number one, because of the master's endowment. Let your eyes drop to the page here and follow with me in verse 14. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Stop right there. The word for at the beginning of verse 14 is the connecting preposition which links this parable to the last one. It's a, it's a connecting word. For it is just like. What is the it just like? The it is the kingdom of God. Going back up to chapter 25 verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable. He tells the story of the ten virgins. Now he tells another parable or the story of the talents. This is about the kingdom of God. The coming kingdom of God is just like a man. A man about to go on a journey. Who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Now the, the word journey here suggests that that this man has gone away for a reason. And when he has accomplished his purposes on that journey, then he will return. Just as the bridegroom in the previous parable returned, just as the Son of Man will come in his glory in the last analogy, verse 31, in this parable, the master on the journey returns. He comes. And when he comes, he comes to settle accounts. Now, it's not very hard to see that this man in the story is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'd like you to notice carefully what this master did. He, he called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. And so right from the start of the parable, we are shown something about the reality of the Lord's ownership. The Lord's ownership. Jesus brings us face to face with this undeniable fact that he is the owner of it all. Notice the emphasis. The servants were his own servants. Do you see it there in verse 14? That which was entrusted to them was, verse 14, his possessions. Do you see it? Underline it, make that little note in your Bible. They were his own 
slaves or servants, and it was his possessions. Now keep in mind that in the New Testament day, servants were, were actually owned by their masters. Uh, they were his possession. They belonged to him. They were his property. The master was responsible for their means, their resources, their well-being, their provisions, their protection. The master was responsible for their family and their future. The master owned them. The servants had no rights. Now I know that may shock some of us American citizens or most of us American citizens because you know we always are trying to stand on our rights. But in this context, these servants had no rights of their own. They were purchased by the master, and so everything that they were given was not theirs, it was a gift from him. And this is one of the key elements in the story, as we shall see it played out. The master owned it all, he entrusted some of his riches to these servants, and resist the mentality of thinking that somehow these servants were mistreated, that they were somehow kept against their will, that somehow they're abused in some way. No, not in this story. In this story, they were made custodians of vast riches. If we compare scripture with scripture, we will see the forecasting of the ascension of Christ. And in Ephesians chapter four, it says when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. Just how great was this investment? Well, in the margins of your Bible, some of you all have little notes in the margins of your Bible, you will discover that a, a, a talent, a single talent, was worth about 15 years of labor. Do you see that note? Do you have that note in, in some of your Bibles there? If you will trace it, it may, you may find that you see the word talent in verse 15. It has a little one by it. Trace it over to the side, and it'll give you that footnote. Others uh, might note that a talent was worth uh, 20 years of labor. Now, really, no one knows. No one really knows how much this would be worth in our day. Some simply say that a talent, get this, was generational wealth. We know for sure that it was substantial. Here's the key. Are you ready? Not one penny, not one ounce was theirs. It all belonged to the master. All of it. Listen, this is a fact that Jesus wants us to see on the very outset of this parable, that everything that we are, everything that we are, everything that we have is on loan from God. Everything. Must I prove it in the word of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. For who regards you as superior? What do you have? that you did not receive. Psalm 50, verses 12, 10 through 12. God says, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all it contains, and the all includes you and me. We belong to God. Ezekiel 18, verse four. The prophet, God said through the prophet, all souls are mine. All souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Job 33 verse 4. 
Job says, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me what? Life. Gives me what? Gives me what? So every breath we take is a gift from did you know that? From God's own hand. Every single breath. Romans 14 8 puts it this way. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are with the Lord's. Acts 17.25 nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. We are like hired men set upon this earth to do our master's will. And the truth of the matter is, is that every breath we take, our blood, our souls, our days, our talents, our abilities, our riches, our lives, our children, everything we have is on loan from God. Would you let that sink into your mind? Would you let that enter into your heart? Or perhaps you don't want to entertain it because you think that it's yours. This is not some new doctrine. As a matter of fact, we can trace this doctrine all the way through the pages of Scripture. The doctrine of creation tells us that everything we have and the very world in which we live belongs to God. Psalm 24, verse 1, For the earth is the Lord's, and all it contains, the world, and those who dwell in it. The doctrine of creation teaches that it all belongs to Him. The doctrine of redemption doubles down on that truth and it tells us that we are not our own for we have been purchased with a price. And therefore we are to glorify God in our bodies. The doctrine of providence tells us that day to day to day that every good thing and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights or the goodness of God with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow, James 1.17. Every goodness that comes into our lives comes from God's own hand. The doctrine of sanctification teaches us this very same truth, that God owns it all. You say, how so in sanctification? Well, this truth is put this way by the hymn writer, Harriet Auber. She puts it this way. Every virtue we possess and every victory won and every thought of holiness is his alone. Every step toward sanctification, every growth, every good that comes from our lives, every chance or opportunity we have to resist evil and we do so, it's by the grace of God. The grace of God. So have you made that realization, dear friends? That God has creator rights over your life. In addition to God's ownership, we're shown and brought face to face with the Lord's sovereignty in verse 15. Jesus tells us in the story that this master that he gave one, five talents, to another, two, to another, one. Verse 15. 
And notice the phrase, and I want you to underline it in your Bible, each according to his own ability. Do you see it? Come on now, talk with me. Preaching is supposed to be a two-way thing, although I'm to do most of the speaking and you're to do the listening, but you all ought to engage with me in this process. So I want you to underline that phrase, each according to his own ability. And then he went on his journey. Now, if you can accept the fact, and I, I hope that you can, I'm teaching you the word of God, and the word of God says that you, you, you should accept this truth, that everything is from God. Every gift you have, everything in your life, not evil, but everything in your life that's good, everything that you have, every providence in your life is from God. Can you accept that? Well, see, some of you say, I don't know, Pastor. I think some of it, some of it is from my own hand. Well, maybe the talents you think you have, you came up with on your own or your parents gave to you, but no, listen. Everything in your life is a gift from God. Now, if you can accept that everything is from God, then it's easy to see that everything then is to be used for him. Because Romans 11.36 teaches this. For from him and through him and to him are all things. You see, it comes from God it is to be used for him to his glory. It's like a parent, a parent who, uh, who gives a child money to buy the parent a gift with. You know how that works, right? <laughs> The, the child doesn't have any cash, no money, no credit, no job, but we give them money to get us a gift with. And then we find joy when they come and bring us the gift. It brings us a satisfaction, doesn't it? This is the picture that the story paints so far, we've discovered that Christ is the rich man who's going on a journey. He's the owner of it all. He's sovereign over it all. And he entrusts us with gifts to be used for his glory. We tracking so far? Two principles emerge at this point that are too important to ignore. Verse 15 gives us these principles. First, this principle. Gifts are given according to one's capacity and God gives the capacity. That's principle number one. Gifts are given according to one's capacity and God gives the capacity. That's what he means by that phrase, each according to his own ability. Now write down these verses and you can read them later if you don't mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 tells us there's a variety of gifts but the same spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says, but one in the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one as he wills. God chooses the capacities and the talents. He's sovereign in the matter. So when you find yourself sitting there saying, you know, I wish I had that ability to sing like Brother Tony or Steve, then just correct yourself and say, no, God wanted me to have the talents I have, and he gave them the talents they have, and I don't need to be envious of their talents and their abilities. 
God has given me my own. You see, God is sovereign in the choice. And remember, God's choices are always wise. God's choices are always good. God knows what he's doing. I was saying to my son, I think last week as I was, we were driving home, boy, if the Lord had given me an ability to play the piano and sing, he knows that I would just mess it up. I get too, I get too emotional, you know, and I just cry halfway through the song or, you know, just keep playing regardless of the time. I, he knows that I didn't need those gifts. Principle number two. God rewards according to faithfulness, not according to the magnificence of the gift. God rewards according to faithfulness, not the magnificence of the gift. Now, as we shall see in the story, the master gives the same reward to the two-talent servant as well as the five-talent servant. And here's the great lesson. Here it is. Diversity of gifts do not mean inferiority of life. Diversity of gifts do not mean or does not mean inferiority of life. You are not less than someone because you have different gifts. Thank you. Can we stop for a moment and try to apply this? I want you to think about what God has blessed you with. Come on now, try hard. God has blessed you with sight, hearing, He's blessed you with the abilities you have, things you have uh, now in your life. If you have children, great. If you don't, that's God's sovereign purposes. Everything that you have is a gift from God. Now, how do we apply this truth so far? This is what I want you to do. Begin to count your blessings. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count them. By the time you get to three, four, five, six, you'll begin to recognize, oh Lord, you've given so much. There's some people who cannot see, some people who cannot hear, some people who cannot taste, some people. I mean, God has given us so much, so much. The master's endowment is sovereignly and graciously given, and what we do with it reveals whether we love the master and whether we belong to him. Now let's consider the servant's employment. Verses 16 through 18 reads this way. Verse 16, follow with me. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. Verse 17, in the same manner the one who had received the two talents gained two more. Verse 18, but he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. You got the picture? Now, the, the way that the servants respond tell us their perspective of the master, and it also tells us their relationship to the master. The same description of faithful obedience is given to the first two servants. Both are said to do something. What did they do? They went and they traded with them, and they doubled the return. The phrase, went and traded with them, is, it implies direct action. And we're not told how they went and traded with them. We're not told if one went and uh, started a, a loan business or if one went and bought some cattle and started to sell, it, sell the cattle. We're not told how. But what we're told 
is that these first two servants took what they had, used it. They used it immediately. They used it without delay. They were entrusted with gifts and they put it to work. We are to do, to do the same. Now here are the marks of the first two servants. They did their work promptly. They did not procrastinate. They did their work perseveringly. They did not quit when they faced obstacles. It wasn't all smooth sailing for them. We can, we can assume that and, and be right on target with it. They perhaps ran into obstacles, but they did not quit. And number three, they did their work purposefully. They wanted to please their master. They were ready to give an account to their master. Promptly, perseveringly, purposefully. Now we are to do the same. We are not to sit on our gifts and squander them. We're to use them for the master's glory. We're like trustees, really. Trustees who've been given a certain amount of wealth from the master himself, and we are to conserve those assets so that they won't be lost and use those assets so that our master would be pleased. Now, who is this one talent servant? Who is he? Verse 18, the description is really a sad one. Will you look at it with me? But he received, but the one, but he who received the one talent went away. He didn't go and trade with it, he went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Unlike the first two, this description is not one of faithful obedience, but one of flagrant disobedience. Flagrant. Alexander McLaren is a Scottish Baptist minister of the late 1800s. He preached a sermon entitled, Why the Talent Was Buried. He makes this observation. He says the reality which the parable was meant to shadow provides answers for a man's actions in their true character and the ugly motives which underlie them. Thus, it becomes us to look well to the underside of our lives, the unspoken convictions, the unformulated motives which work mightily upon us because for the most part they work in the dark. This is Christ's explanation of the refusal to serve him. Now this is what we know for sure. The one talent servant is a person who is ultimately cast into the outer darkness. So it is evident that he is not a true believer. He's not a true believer. He is a professing believer. He is a professing servant. He is one who has been in the church, so to speak, but he has no real relationship to the Lord. He is like the five foolish virgins. He has an outward relationship with the church, an outward testimony of faith, but there is no inward relationship that results in works, faithful works. Now this is why we're taught in the New Testament that works matter. Faithful works matter. We are not saved by works, but if we do have saving faith, it will be accompanied with faithful works. 
If it is not, then we have a non-saving faith, according to James. According to James chapter 2, verse 14, what use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? No, it cannot. It's non-saving faith. James 2, 17, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Has no saving power. And so there are three kinds of faith that James speaks of. Dead faith, demonic faith, and dynamic faith. And we fall into one of those three categories. Either our faith is dead, we simply profess it, but there's no works. Or it's demonic faith, meaning that it's orthodox and it even gets emotional. Like the demons who tremble. But it is not obedient. Or it's dynamic faith, like that of Abraham, like that of Rahab. It shows itself in works. And so at this point in the parable, I think it's important for us to pause for a moment and make sure that we understand that Jesus is not telling this story so that we believe salvation is by works. Jesus is warning us. I said he's warning us that a profession with the lips that is not reflected in the life is a dangerous thing. You see, the first two servants were faithful and they were diligent and the way that they showed their love for the master was to faithfully serve him. Ah, but not so with the third. We will drill down on why he did what he did in just a moment. So let's pause again for a second. Take a good breath. How do we apply this now to our lives? May I ask you a question? What are the things that you are really serious about? What are the things that I take most seriously in my life? Uh, that's, that's still a little bit too surfacy. Let's drill down into it a little bit further. Let me ask it this way. Does the way that I order my life give evidence that ultimately the most important thing to me is the glory of God? Does my schedule, does my engagements, does my energy show that I am really living for the master's glory? He said, Pastor, why is, it, why is it important that we even think about this stuff? I came to church to get a nice slap on the back and a good tickle of the ear. I can't help you there, dear friend. But the reason why this is important for us to think about on a Sunday morning like this is because of the last point, the master's evaluation. He's coming. He's coming. And verse 19 tells us, after a long delay, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The, the term long there may have tempted the servants to think that, the, that they would never give an account of their life, but they did. After a long time, the master of those slaves came. And it signals to us in the first place that there is a certainty of judgment that's coming. He came. 
He came to settle accounts. He was not there at one point and then he arrived. That's the term. He was not there. It seemed like all was going normal and then all of a sudden the hoofbeats of a thousand horses could be heard in the distance. All of a sudden now you could see a cloud of dust rising to the east. All of a sudden now you could hear the crackling of the chariot wheels rolling. It got louder and louder and louder. All of a sudden then you could see the tip of a, a banner. Someone of real prominence was on the way. He had arrived in the province. Who is it? It's the master. Now he will come to settle accounts with me. What will that day be like? when Jesus comes to settle accounts with us. We don't have to guess very, very much at all. According to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, we're told that it's going to be a day of public exposure. Now, let me prove this to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. I should hear pages turning. He said, Pastor, it's going to be on the screen for us. Yes, it, it may be, but it may not be. So always have your Bible ready. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Solomon says this as he gets to the end of this book. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. The conclusion. Often that's where you go in a book when you want to get to the bottom line, huh? You read the introduction, you read the conclusion, and you say, okay, I got it. No, you should read the whole book. <laughs> the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments. Because this applies to just the people in the church. No, this applies to who? This applies just to the deacons and the elders. No, this applies to? Well, Pastor, I'm really not a member of the church, so this, I get a pass on this, right? I'm not a member, I just attend here. Does this, does this exclude you? This applies to? Every person. Now, verse 14. For God will bring some acts to judgment. Every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. You didn't want to read that, did you? Everything. Everything. Oh, I can see the wheels turning. You're trying to find a New Testament verse to explain that away, aren't you? Well, let me take you to the New Testament. Because it doesn't explain it away, but it actually further clarifies it. And in the New Testament, we're told not only will it be a day of public exposure, but it will be a day of powerful revelation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says each man's work will become evident for the day, the day, the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And you know what fire does, right? It just, it, it, it consumes all that is, that is not Pure and within the very metal itself, it brings the dross to the top so that you scrape it off and what you have left is, is pure gold. The fire, the fire of God's judgment will test the quality of each man's work. Not the quantity, but the quality. It'll be a day of public exposure. It'll be a day of powerful revelation. But listen, it will also be a day of personal commendation. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. 
some of you sometimes uh, wonder whether you're really appreciated or not. And, you know, those in your family or maybe even in the church do not affirm your worth or your efforts or your service. Don't worry about it. I said, don't worry about it. Because, you see, there comes a day, there is coming a day when God, when God will affirm you. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him. From who? Didn't we read about that in the parable? Didn't the master say to some, well done, good and faithful servant. Can you imagine God affirming the gifts and the faithfulness that he has given to you and what you were faithful to and affirming those before the entire universe I hesitate to use personal stories, but you know, I played Pop Warner football when I was a young kid. Played for about seven years. And uh, I enjoyed playing Pop Warner football. When I got to the seventh grade, they started to get a little too big and hit a little too hard. So I decided to go to the, the soft, delicate sport of basketball. My dad was at every game. And we won most of our games, and we, we lost some, but we won most of them. And you know, whether I scored two touchdowns or didn't score at all, what mattered to me most was what my dad would say when I came off the field. Sometimes, when he didn't say anything for a little period of time, it was the most difficult time in my life because I was looking at his eyes and looking at his features to see what he thought. But when he spoke, ah, uh, that's what I needed to hear. What did my dad think? It mattered. It matters to each child and it matters to every one of us, what we hear from God on that day, it will matter more than we know. On that day, God will not ask you, well, what did the church do? He will not ask you, well, what, what, what did your deacons do? He will ask what you did. What did you do with what I gave to you? And on that day, no excuses will work. Oh, you can tell excuses to your pastor and to your boss and to your parents. You can find a way to talk around us easily. But on that day, no one will talk around God. The only thing that will matter on that day was, did the time that God gave to us, was it productive years or was it wasted years? Come on. We must not waste any more time serving trifling issues in this life. We must be about the master's business. We do not know when he will call us home or come again. Let's get about the master's business. He has given to each one of us Wonderful gifts. They are not yours. They're his. Let's serve his purposes so that we stand before him on that day with no regret. 
that we stretched out, that we gave everything to serve his cause, that we did not hold back. And on that day, if we do, there will be this commendation of judgment. As with the first two servants, they were expecting, they were enthusiastic when they came forward. Did you notice the joy in their statement? I'm coming to a close, stay with me here. There's joy, there's excitement, enthusiasm. Verse 20, they came, they brought their talents. They said, Master, see, you gave me this. I have this. They are looking forward You can see and feel the enthusiasm. Why? Because they have a relationship with their master. They know who he is. They know what he's about. And here's the thing. These first two servants loved the idea of gaining an interest for him. They loved that idea. They're faithful, they get the same praise, identical, same wording for both of them. What does it tell us? It tells us that the same reward is given to the servant with lesser capacity and smaller gifts as the greater one. In other words, if Martin Luther was a five talent guy and he was faithful, well, if I am a one-talent person and I am faithful, I will get the same reward as Martin Luther. I'll get the same reward as John Calvin. I'll get the same reward as Charles Spurgeon. I'll get the same reward. I have lesser gifts. I'll get the same reward. And it all depends on one thing. One thing. One thing. What is it? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Can you, can you enter into that? It's not about their creativity. It's not about their intellectual capacity. It's not about their success. It is about their faithfulness. Oh, the master's response is one of delight. Excellent. Well done. Great. Wonderful. You are a good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Oh, there have been chapters upon chapters written about that phrase. What is the joy of the master? Did you recognize that in the parable of the ten virgins, that the five that entered into the the wedding feast with the master, nothing is said about the joy of the wedding feast itself. Nothing is said. They just enter into it, the doors close, nothing is said. And I believe that that is inspired of the Spirit of God to tell us by argument from silence that we cannot describe the joy of the presence of the Lord. We can't describe it. It's, it's indescribable. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, in your presence, presence, presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore, but that's it. What will it be? Ah, the Word of God teaches one thing for sure. It will be unbroken. <laughs> I wish somebody would get a little happy. It'll be unbroken. You know how when you're enjoying a good time, something always has to come and break up that joy. Sometimes it's your own family, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it's uh, your friends. Sometimes it's just time. You know, you got to stop this and go do that because you got a job to do and something interrupts the joy. 
Perhaps it's your body. You get tired. You know, you've been at a, a party all day. You've been enjoying yourself, but you can't go on because your body's just tired and you got to go home. Something in this life always breaks up the joy. But listen, for the believer, we're going to enter into a joy that is unbroken. It's never going to stop. Unshaded. Eternal joy. All right. In five minutes, I'm going to cover the last point. Someone rebuked me this week and said, Pastor, you don't need to be a time lord so much. I try to explain to them that I need to be sensitive to people's time because not everyone has the same capacity. I'm tempted to come back to this last point next week, but I don't want to break up the story. The story ends with the judgment of the unfaithful servant. And if you'll notice carefully, the unfaithful servant makes an excuse and he gives an accusation. He says, I was afraid of, of you. But then he disclaims any responsibility for the talents that he has. Why is this man, why is this man condemned in the end? Well, verse 24 tells us, because he misjudged his master's character. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. That word means harsh. I knew you to be a, a dictator, a tyrant. I knew you to be one who was a legalist. All work, no pay. You see, this last servant didn't even really know who his master was. In church, there are people the same way. You come to church, <clears throat> And the truth of the matter is, is that you see God as just someone who demands more than he gives. You see God as a hard master, a hard man, a hard Lord. But the truth of the matter is, is that you don't know him. Because our God is one who Giving is a part of his nature. Our God is one who, who you can't even stop him from giving because to stop God from giving would be like stopping the rays from the sun. If that man had just looked in his own hands, it should have shut his mouth. Because what he had in his hands was the master's. But the force of the Greek language tells us that he had a hostile attitude. He misjudged his master's character. And therefore, he is condemned. Verse 25, I was afraid. I went away, hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. It's a very forceful word. It means literally that he, he, he said, see, and he threw it at him. Take yours. You have what is yours. Hostile. Bitter. Disrespectful. You'll say, Pastor, nobody in church would feel this way about God, right? Nobody. Nobody would actually say these things of God, would they? Dear friends, this is the teaching of Scripture concerning the nature of every person's heart without God. Deep in the heart of 
of mankind apart from God is coiled, this snake of rebellion that will stand up to God's face. And if it could, it would tear him down from his throne. You said even religious people in church who are unsafe feel that way about God? They may cover it in religious tones. They may cover it in moral uprightness. But at the back, at the back of that unwashed black heart is this spirit of rebellion. This is why we must be born again. This is why we need to be washed from our sins. This is why God has provided a salvation that cleanses from within. Because we're all stained and we're all poisoned from birth with this kind of heart. And that's why we need to be born from above. Every single one of us. And Jesus says, unless it happens, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. Why, why is there such a disinterested love? Why is there such an unthankfulness? Why do you act as if God owes you something? Ah, there it is. Uh, it's because of this heart. This, this servant wasn't a, he wasn't a murderer. He wasn't an adulterer. But deep in his soul, he was an unchanged man. I knew you to be a hard man, he says. I did nothing with it. I buried it. Here, take what is yours. He is rebuked not only because of his inconsistency and pretended fear, but he is also rebuked and condemned because of his wicked character. And the master calls him such. You wicked and lazy slave. Well, we can say much about this. But let it suffice to say that in the words of James Montgomery Boyce, by the standard of laziness, how many wicked people must there be in our churches? This man is stripped of what he has. The very thing that he has is taken away from him. If one dies without Jesus, when you go into eternity, you will not go into eternity with the knowledge you have had on earth. You will have that stripped from you and you will go into eternity with none of the privileges you had on earth. None. He is sentenced. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. Have you heard those words before? Worthless. What did Jesus say about salt? When salt has lost its flavor, it is useless, worthless, to be thrown out. It doesn't serve its purpose. This is what we are when we don't serve our purpose before God. We were created for him. If we don't live for him, we lose our purpose. He is thrown into outer darkness. Outer darkness. Outer darkness. There's no place for him in this world and there's no place for him in the coming kingdom. It's a place outside of the gracious love of God. It is a place away from the transforming glory of Christ. There are places on this earth, even now, that it's so dark you can't even see your hand in front of your face. It's so dark. This place will be darker still. 
no laughter, no light, no joy. This is a place that will have fire without light. And in that place, Jesus says, there will be weeping. It, it means a loud wailing. Not, not a silent cry, not a, not a silent whimper. But in that place, Jesus describes it as a place that will have a, a painful, miserable, loud cry. And it will be a place where the teeth are gnashed. I've been told by my, my dentist that I grind at night, so I have to use a mouth guard. But this is not just a grinding of teeth. This is a gnashing. It's a place of regret. Eternal regret. You don't have to go to this place. No one has to go to this place. No one. But it's the fate of all who reject Christ. It's the fate of all who refuse to accept his offers of love. It's the place of all who are not ready, who are not faithful. It'll be a world with no, no, no diversions, just a conscious punishment and an eternal regret forever and ever and ever. That's where the story ends. So that's where we will end. J.C. Ryle says, don't, don't leave this parable without a solemn determination by God's grace to never be content with professing Christianity without the practice. He says, let us not talk of religion, let us act. Let us not only feel the importance of saving faith, let us do something. Beware, he says, of a do-nothing Christianity. So what hinders you from being sold out for Jesus Christ? What hinders you from trading, using your gifts for his glory? Are you serving the master? Why not? Do you fear exposure? Do you fear the difficulty of the journey? Do you fear failing? What do you fear? Why aren't you sold out for Jesus Christ? Well, perhaps the reason you don't is because you have an indifference toward the master himself. You don't really like him. And the reason you don't like him is because you don't know him. Because if you knew him, you would love him. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's the bright and morning star. He's the giver of all gifts that are good. And his love came all the way from heaven to earth for you to bear your sin and mine. It's a love that will not let you go. No matter how many times you stub your toe. It's a grace that keeps you when you're all alone. Would you like to know this Savior? Then come with me and, and let us survey the cross. Let us see from his, 
his head and his hands and his feet. Sorrow and love that flows mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or did, did, did thorns ever compose so rich a crown? If you could be given all of the beautiful forests of the world, if you could be given all of the real estate of the world, if you could be given all of the money in the banks of the world, if you could be given all of the gold mines and the silver mines, and if you could be given all of the animal kingdoms of this world to be yours, that would be a present far too small. If you didn't have the love of Christ, this love that Jesus gives is so amazing, <laughs> it's so divine, it demands not part of you, all of you, and all of me, everything, it demands it. And we freely give it, we freely give it to the one who is worthy to be praised. Come, dear friends, let's Let's linger at Calvary and see the empty tomb and the ascended Christ. And let us come and hold nothing back and serve him faithfully until he comes. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Thank you for your patience. Would you make an altar of that place right where you're sitting? And even as you close your eyes, and you battle the thought of sleepiness, would you just pray in your heart, oh God, help me to receive the truth and to act on it. That may mean for you, as you bow your head, to give up those things that the Lord has already been pointing out in your life because they hinder you from serving his cause. There could be others where you bow your head and you know it's just been pure, pure laziness. And it says something about your character that you don't want to say. And if you believe that you've been justified by faith in Christ, certainly you want to work for his glory. So it's time today to say, Lord, forgive me. I will endeavor to use my remaining time to serve your purposes. Thank you, Father, for this uh, very searching and very strong parable. And Lord, we know that we have only really seeing various streams of light from it. If the hindrances were removed in our mind, we, we would see so much more. We thank you for what you have shown to us. Help us to respond to the light we have. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said.